Welcome back, everyone. Whether this is your first session today or your second, I would love to welcome you to today's virtual family conference that's been sponsored so graciously by Levo Therapeutics. Before we begin today's presentation, let's first thank our amazing sponsors. Levo Therapeutics, Soleno Therapeutics, Harmony Biosciences, Rhythm Pharmaceuticals, Saniona, and Novo Nordisk. Their support has allowed us to make this conference free for all of our community members, and nearly 800 of you have taken advantage of this Hello. wonderful presentation. Um, in today's session, A Caregiver's Guide to Deconstructing Anxiety, Dr. Singh will be breaking down anxiety and discussing the many factors that could lead to it, as well as discuss how it can be treated. As a parent of a child who struggles with anxiety, this presentation is amongst my top um, picks for today's session. But before we jump right in, I would like to get to know each of you a little bit better with a short poll. Let us know how old is your loved one, PWS? Does your loved one experience anxiety? Yes, no, maybe you're not sure. And at what age did anxiety begin to impact your child, if you can recall? I know for our family, anxiety was, it was a slow burn. We didn't really realize what it was we were up against. We couldn't de fully define it for several years. So here are the results. We have a nice distribution across ages. We have people as young as zero to five. We also have adults 18 plus joining us today. 77% of the people on the call today say that their loved one does experience anxiety. And I'm guessing it's the younger ages that you're just not quite sure yet. That's great because Dr. Singh is gonna be ta talking to us about what anxiety looks like. And perhaps by the end of today's session, you'll be able to identify it in your loved one. And the question that many of us are asking is, at what age did anxiety begin to impact your loved one? Um, it looks like most people have said from five to 10 years, about 36% of people have responded in those early childhood um, school years. But even under five years old, some people are saying that anxiety is impacting their loved one. And um, for some of us, it's just not impacting yet. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing that poll and give a quick introduction to our speaker today. Dr. Deepan Singh holds a board certification in general psychiatry, as well as child and adolescent psychiatry. Dr. Singh has helped treat PWS patients across a wide spectrum of symptoms, ranging from mild attention deficit to severe aggression and psychosis. He has published on the occurrence of cycloid psychosis, psy cycloid, psychosis, that was a tongue twister, in PWS, and is the first to report on the use of guanfacine extended release in the management of behavioral problems associated with PWS. So without further ado, I'd like to give you to Dr. Deepan Singh. Um, Dr. Singh, if you can go ahead and turn on your camera, we'll get your screen up and running. His PC froze. So in any live conference, we are going to come up against some technology issues and this session is the one, but that's okay because in the meantime, with Dr. Singh coming on board, I've got a story to tell you. Since you are all here to listen about anxiety, I'm gonna share with you a little bit of our journey. Um, if you know me or if you've attended a behavior or anxiety session in the past, you know that anxiety has been a huge issue for our family. Um, Jaden loves school, he's very social, he loves sports, but anxiety has always been a really big issue. And until he was probably in fourth grade, we didn't really identify it. We didn't know what it was. We thought he was just being a tough kid. We thought that he was just acting out. But as we got further into the school years, we realized that this wasn't just behavior, it was actually anxiety that was driving him to refuse to participate, to not go to school. And to say, interestingly enough, that his tummy hurt. I used to think that he was, again, just being, he just didn't want to go to school, so he was making things up. He was saying his tummy hurt. And then I read an interesting article um, about typical children, and it said, 
oftentimes typical kids don't know what anxiety feels like so they'll say their tummy hurts and i wish i had read that article earlier i wish i had known that Jaden wasn't just making up stories that his tummy hurt he was expressing anxiety so for that very reason i'm so excited to have dr singh here so that hopefully you all can be better prepared to understand what anxiety looks like what it might feel like in our loved ones and ideally be able to treat it so that your kids can be more comfortable in their own skin. So Dr. Singh, I'm thrilled to have you here. I'm glad you were able to get your PC back up and running. I believe our audience is here. Over 200 of them are waiting to hear from you. Very good. Okay, so if there are any problems, just let me know. Uh, I know it's 3.15 already, but uh, I've heard that there isn't a speaker after me. And, uh, you know, hopefully I won't uh, make everybody fall asleep, uh, but, as you can see in this, I'm gonna jump right into it because we have a lot of information to cover and I'm sure you'll have the slides available to you after this. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll have enough time for a Q and A. So uh, I named this deliberately, seeing the trees through the forest. And as you all are familiar with the phrase, you know, we often get lost looking at the trees and we kind of forget the big picture. Uh, but in, in, when it comes to anxiety, the concern is more getting lost in the symptom, right? And, and the aspect of worrying rather than being able to recognize the underlying cause for the worrying. So we're gonna just, uh, we're gonna try to decipher that dilemma. Now, uh, in, my, in my practice, I noticed that uh, people come in very often patients, the families of patients, you know, they, uh, they express that the biggest reason for them to come in to see me is anxiety. Um, and the, as a psychiatrist, it's um, one of the first things I do is to explain what anxiety is, and we'll try to do that today, and then kind of help them see that anxiety, the way we understand it, uh, and the way the medical professionals understand it is very different from how it presents in Trilovili syndrome. So that's another objective of, our, of ours today. And then to try to think about compulsivity and perseveration, response perseveration, and we'll talk a bit more about that, and how that differs from anxiety as a symptom uh, when uh, medical professionals, uh, the way we think about it. And then we'll also, uh, given time, we'll also think about some common ways anxiety presents in our patients uh, and uh, the treatments that we use. Now, anxiety, um, simplistically, is pathological worrying. So worrying is, is normal, it protects us, right? Our flight and fight uh, responses, our sympathetic system revs up, uh, our heart rate goes up, we sense threat and danger in the environment, and this is all protective. We, we need that. You know, we were running away from, uh, you know, all sorts of predators uh, not too long ago, you know, just, uh, and, and even a few hundred years ago, we were still in danger uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, dying from things which now seem innocuous and things that we don't need to worry about. But pathological worrying is that despite there being no danger in your environment, you can't stop worrying about things. And it's perseverative. It, one of the key aspects of pathological worrying or anxiety is, is perseverative cognition, cognition. So perseveration, as many of you might be familiar, is not being able to stop thinking about the same thing. Right, and you might notice that in yourself. You don't have to think about it in the context of PWS. If you think about it yourself in your day-to-day -day life, there are things that we kind of worry about endlessly, right? Despite there being enough sort of, uh, especially during times of stress. Like we all know, we are you know stressed out right now. We are trying to make uh, the best of a really horrible situation, living through a pandemic, and and sometimes you'll find yourself. Like you try to do something else, but your mind is wandering. And very often just, you know, it's normal for us to sort of gravitate towards worrying negative thoughts. Now, if it goes kind of out of hand and it starts negatively affecting our overall functioning, that is when we call it 
and, uh, and anxiety disorder. And it's a transdiagnostic process, which means that a ton of different things can lead to the same um, outward appearance. So one can appear anxious, but the underlying cause could be many different things, right? Uh, and we'll talk a bit more about, uh, you know, what kind of different things can contribute to it. And basically our, uh, our job as psychiatrists and mental health providers and your physicians would be to work with you to help define a timeline. Because, you know, if it means different things if someone is kind of anxious and perseverative all the time versus it comes and goes. So it's very important for us to draw a timeline and think about what is episodic versus what is chronic. Okay, episodes means comes and goes versus chronic means it's the patient is suffering uh, almost every day with that symptom. So uh, in order to better understand how we see anxiety in, in the mental health profession is, uh, is to look at the DSM anxiety disorders, right? So when, you, when you're going to a physician, to a psychologist, you know, a psychologist, a social worker, they're really trying to kind of decipher, especially if they're not familiar with PWS, they're really trying to like, you know, diagnose so that they can treat appropriately, which makes sense, right? So it's very important for you to know what your psychiatrists and what your mental health providers are thinking on the back end. And what we're thinking of are DSM-5 anxiety disorders, you know, and the DSM is, uh, is, a, is the diagnostic and statistical manual and it's in the, its fifth edition. It's kind of like our uh, dictionary and, uh, you know, with descriptions of all kinds of different mental illnesses. Now, anxiety disorders, by the way, are extremely common. They are the most important, uh, most commonly prevalent uh, disorders in the general population. So by extension, our, our patients, our loved ones with Prader-Willi syndrome will naturally uh, be more likely to have anxiety disorders just by the fact that it is more prevalent in, uh, in uh, the general population. However, uh, it's hard to kind of like, I'm going to use the word pigeonhole, but it's hard for us to kind of like categorize the symptoms that we see in patients with Prader-Willi syndrome and try to kind of pigeonhole them into a particular diagnosis which is more generally more uh, prevalent in the in patients without Prader-Willi syndrome so the most common one of the most common um, anxiety disorders you know the two most common are actually specific phobia is probably the most common and generalized anxiety disorder is the second most common now specific phobia is when people have uh, a specific circumscribed fear so they don't have like over overwhelming anxiety in relation to anything other than one specific issue. So it could be, for example, a common one is a fear of germs, a fear of spiders, a fear of the number 13, so a fear of snakes. And you know, the only time we actually diagnose and treat it is if it's coming in their way. And as you can imagine, you're not, you know, you're not coming across a snake every day, you know? So although it's a, it's a very common diagnosis, we don't, I don't really see it a lot in Prader-Willi syndrome. And in general, even in the general population, it's actually not something that psychiatrists deal with very commonly, although they are quite commonly prevalent, but people are able to manage even with the illness. Generalized anxiety disorder is, uh, is a diagnosis that I do see quite often in Prader-Willi syndrome. Uh, but it, it presents kind of differently, and I'll tell you how. So generalized anxiety disorder, the way it presents in, in you or I or pe people without Prader-Willi syndrome, is there's a constant worrying, right, which is not attributable to one particular thing, unlike specific phobia. So they worry about a myriad of everything. Okay, oh, did I leave the, uh, the, um, the front door unlocked? Did I look, uh, leave the... Uh, you know, uh, I have I have to finish. Uh, a deadline is approaching, and I haven't done that, uh, finished that task yet. Or, oh, are uh, did I prepare the meals for the kids? Or did I help them with the homework? Or did I, you know? So there's like they're worrying about anything and everything, right? And and it takes a toll over time on our bodies, right? So our mind starts racing. It's hard for us to sleep. We start developing headaches and back aches. It's very common. And you know, if uh, if there are 200, uh, you know, screens on right now, 
I bet many of you are here because you have noticed that probably in yourself because the burden of taking care of someone with a chronic condition such as Paravalli syndrome can take a toll and lead to generalized anxiety symptoms. It's, a very, it's very common and it's very closely linked to stress. So even people without a genetic component can, can get that just because of chronic stress. Now, separation anxiety is another one that I, that I do see quite commonly, especially in, uh, in uh, younger kids. So separation anxiety is when, uh, when it's more common in kids but can also be seen in adults. Uh, it's when the attachment figure, which is usually the parent or a caregiver or grandparent, you know, the, and the patient are very, you know, the patient is very fearful of losing their attachment figure. So they're constantly preoccupied uh, with thinking about them. They would constantly ask about them. Now, this is something that I bet you've seen in many of your loved ones. In patients with prado willi syndrome, they would very often get very attached to caregivers, not just to their parents, but, you know, you have a home health aide, you have, uh, you know, uh, another helper who's coming in, and all of a sudden they get, they kakek, they attach to that person to such an extent that they're constantly asking you, are they okay, are they coming, are they coming now, are they coming tomorrow, when are they coming? So there's a perseverative uh, anxiety linked to that as well. So it is quite common. And then uh, there's, uh, there's, finally, there's also social anxiety, the fear of, opening up and talking about, uh, talking in front of others, speaking up in front of others, and there's a fear of embarrassment, which is not something I would see very commonly in PWS, but it can happen in the higher functioning uh, patients. However, one can see that, like, our patients, our loved ones with prado syndrome, they have um, a conglomerate, like, different sets of symptoms. They don't, you can't really think of prado syndrome anxiety as an entity fitting into one neat bucket of GAD specific phobia, separation anxiety, social anxiety. So we need to think more about it. So what else can we think of? So now comes something called obsessive compulsive disorder and related disorders. So we have that uh, another section in, uh, in the DSM-5. And that includes things like obsessive compulsive disorder in which there is a disabling um, you know, obs so obsessions are basically th uh, the uh, inability to stop thinking about a negative, um, you know, uh, inability to get a negative thought out of your head, even if you don't like that thought, and kind of like it rec it recurs. It could sometimes be images. So you might have, pay, uh, you know, loved ones who come up to you and say that, you know, I'm having this thought about hurting you, or I'm having this thought about hurting myself. But it, it you be you know our job is of course that's a very alarming and scary sort of symptom. So you need to bring that to our attention, and our job is to kind of decipher that from true thoughts about self harm or aggression versus um, obsessions, which are not really you know which are sort of distressing, but don't really lead to aggressive or self harm behaviors. So that's important to note. And compulsions, so those are obsessions, compulsions are recurrently sort of engaging in activities, right, to get rid of anxiety. And usually it occurs along with obsessions, but sometimes it can, they can occur independent of obsessive thoughts. And usually it would be things like hand washing, which is a very common one, uh, but very often it could be things like counting the same things over and over again or having to redo tasks if they don't seem perfect. Now, I know that many of you are thinking, my goodness, this is happening with my child. But it looks, a way, it looks in PWS, because it's along with a mix of so many other symptoms, it's hard to classify that as pure OCD. And, and the treatment for OCD differs from what would be ideal for the treatment of the anxiety that you see in patients with prado syndrome. Again, there's body dysmorphic disorder where people are preoccupied with their appearance or a part of their body, usually like the nose or facial structure, sometimes other parts of the body. Not something that I see very commonly in PWS, but um, again, it, like none of the things that I'm talking about, uh, it's people, are, people with PWS are not immune to any of these disorders, right? But I just want you to be educated about the different ways anxiety presents. 
Um, hoarding is interesting, and I think uh, many of you would recognize this. In fact, it's so hoarding behavior is so common in Prader-Willi syndrome that the DSM specifically mentions PWS as something that has hoarding as part of it, and you should not diagnose hoarding disorder in someone who has Prader-Willi syndrome. That's uh, that that's very interesting to me, and you know I've had patients who would hoard anything from keys to stationary items are extremely common. Uh, to be used in hoarding behaviors and and sometimes it can be very uh, dangerous because you know as you know patients with PWS are prone to scoliosis and then they'll carry these heavy bags of stationery and that can make their back problems worse so something to watch out for and of course all of you are probably familiar most of you have uh, may have seen some form of excoriation disorder which, which is basically skin picking and um, in more severe forms, it can involve rectal picking as well. Uh, and these are both quite common. Now, I just like a short caveat about the importance for you to be educated about this because the mental health providers that, that are not used to seeing, say, rectal picking, they will, they kind of, they have different associations with it. They might think of it as an oppositional behavior. I, I actually had a therapist call me once kind of panicking and said, oh, there's a lot of rectal picking here and do you think that they're fixated in the anal stage of development, which is which comes from like, uh, you know, uh, the construct of Freudian, uh, you know, psychology. And, and again, I, you know, with all respect, I, 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 you know, there are lots of uses for a lot of psychological um, theories but not when it comes to PWS. It really does not, uh, you know, it's not something that people, that they are doing deliberately. It's not a malicious, well thought out uh, activity. So you gotta be careful and maybe help educate uh, their current providers if they don't understand the symptom cluster. Okay, now, uh, so again, so going back, so which all goes to prove that, you know, PWS it's not like a neatly packable anxiety symptom. So, so it's hard to categorize uh, within the DSM-5 constraints, and we need to really look at the trees through the forest. Okay, what kind of symptoms are afflicting or affecting our loved ones the most? Because they're unique. They're common aspects, as we discussed, but they're things unique to your loved one and we need to recognize that and treat that. Okay, so so let's start unpacking anxiety in Prader-Willi syndrome. And um, I don't know if this uh, this uh, animation is playing well on everyone's screens, but this is uh, this just shows Donald Duck. For those of you calling in, uh, repeatedly you know banging his head against the wall, and. And this brings me to the construct of response perseveration. Now, believe it or not, if for, for you scientists out there listening to this, if you, if you go into PubMed or another resource to look at response perseveration, most of the literature will actually pertain to things like gambling uh, and, and some, sometimes antisocial behavior. However, the, it applies, the construct applies to Prader-Willi syndrome really well if you, if, so let me read it out. So it's response perseveration is the inappropriate repetition of a particular response despite the absence or cessation or of reward. Let me give you a good example which you will all identify as something happening in your households or, you know, it's a very common occurrence is they come, uh, so, you know, very, very often parents or lo uh, patient, you know, loved ones or patients will come up to me and say, Dr. Singh, they won't stop asking the same questions over and over and over and over again. Now, in, pers in, in, in people uh, without response perseveration, in a child, you know, think of yourself as a child right now, you go, to, go up to your parent or, or another or to a teacher and you're kind of nagging them, right? And you, you're upset, right? So you, you really want to know when, uh, you know, when the sort of, uh, uh, when the next break is, you know, or, or when, when can they get to color? When can I get to color? When, I, when can I get to color? And you can see the expression or the frustration 
on the face of your loved one and that makes you stop right there's a negative not only a cessation of reward there is a negative feedback you know when you look at the expression on the other person's face right and then uh, or in their response to you and then you then you stop you may feel bad but you're able to stop right but in people who have response perseveration they're going to keep going right and let's try to think about why that's happening in PWS now it's in Prado-Willi syndrome, compulsivity, which is the repetitive questioning and uh, intrusive behavior despite negative response for, for, with caregivers, that's closely related to response perseveration, right? So they can't, they can't really stop thinking about it. They can't stop doing the same thing over and over despite getting that negative feedback. So is it anxiety or is it impulsivity? Is it that, is it that they're, so, they're extremely nervous or is it that they can't stop themselves? Which one is the real underlying factor here? And all, all our uh, current research is actually pointing us to impulsivity, poor impulse control. Now, what is impulsivity? The imp impulsivity is the tendency to engage in rash, ill-considered action in response to intense negative emotions. And this is associated with low volumes of prefrontal cortex. We'll talk more about the neurobiology. I'll just touch upon that because it's important for you to know how the brain differs. But basically, if one is to think about uh, the, our patients with Prado-Willi syndrome as having impulsivity, so poor impulse control, response perseveration, then that kind of, takes us away from our from a construct like a simplistic construct of anxiety as a like psychological problem versus it makes us think of these behaviors that may appear as anxiety right because of the rep repetitive questioning because of the you know uh, inability to stop doing the same thing over and over, over and over despite getting all of these negative responses and we think of it as impulsivity now as you can see in this image, this poor child is like has been told many times not to touch the electric, uh, the electric socket, but uh, they can't stop themselves. And yeah, it really is a reactive kind of, uh, you know, so people talk about aggression in, in Prado-Willi syndrome, right? Uh, and that also goes back to impulse control. So as opposed to response perseveration, which we spoke about as an abnormal phenomenon, what we want to somehow create in our patients and in ourselves and what, what would be normal and what would be ideal is response monitoring, right? Not response perseveration, but response monitoring. And response monitoring is the capacity to flexibly adapt to dynamic environments and is crucial. It, it is something that we do all the time, right? So we are able to, so we see that negative response, it's in the environment, and we noticed that this is something new. I was expecting uh, like them to just give me the coloring book and the, and the sketch pens and, uh, and the markers, and, but, but that didn't happen. So I have to adapt. Maybe I have to use another strategy. Maybe I have to give them a break. Maybe I'll come back in an hour. But that, all of that is not happening in our patients with Prado-Willi syndrome because there may be a difficulty in response monitoring. So let's think about where response monitoring, com monitoring comes from. Again, it points to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Now, uh, so, in it, so that brings us to a very important point. So studies have shown that in addition to the expected volume loss, and you know, we know that there's a there's pan hypopituitarism, right? So all the hormonal conditions that our patients go through, that our loved ones go through, that's coming because the hypothalamus and pituitary, which is part of the lower brain, they are not secreting, uh, their, their volume is lower and they're not secreting enough, uh, you know, um, hormones. But in addition, a big difference between patients with prado syndrome and normal subjects, and normal uh, individuals, uh, would be a low, a low volume of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. That's the front of the brain. That's the more 
but that's a newer part of the brain. It's also called the neo neocortex, right? Which is the, the big part of the brain in the front, right? And that gives us executive functioning, planning, the ability to stop ourselves when we want to do something, but it's not the right thing to do. And, and if that, you can imagine if that part, which controls the rest of the brain and tells it to calm down, is not functioning adequately, it will lead to impulsivity and aggression, and it will also lead to inflexibility because they can't adapt to the rapidly changing environment that we live in, uh, and in turn appear as anxiety. So that's important for us to keep in mind. So what is the diagnosis, right? So if one was to kind of say, you know what, I'm like, uh, you know, I can't treat a patient without having a diagnosis linked to my patient and there's no way, you know, I, I don't know what I'm treating here. Is this anxiety? Is this, is it PWS? Is it OCD? What is it? So like, it, it, this is a mouthful, but this is what it would look like in most of my patients. And yes, I do have patients who have like very easily diagnosable OCD like as a separate issue and I do have some patients who may have other sort of generalized anxiety very you know prominent symptoms that helps me classify it as something separate from Prader-Willi syndrome but in reality if you look at the most commonly occurring symptoms most patients uh, would, uh, would meet the diagnosis of obsessive compulsive and related disorder due to PWS with OCD like symptoms hoarding symptoms and skin picking symptoms mouthful but that's that's the you know that's the bottom line. bottom line is that there's no additional value to try to pigeonhole our our loved ones it is more valuable to look at what symptoms are most impairing to them and then try to treat them so um, I hope that aspect was helpful just talking about anxiety as a phenomenon, as an overall phenomenon and what the underlying causes could be. And then we also talked about what the most commonly occurring symptoms are, um, which appear as anxiety. We also spoke a bit about the underlying pathology, underlying brain dysfunction that explains uh, impulsivity, which is closely related to anxiety in patients with PWS. Now I'm going to talk, um, uh, we have a bit more time, so I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to list some medications. I'll talk briefly about their role in patients with PWS and also kind of like warn you about some of the most common side effects. And, and here's when I know everyone is scrambling for like a pen and piece of paper. And, you know, uh, I, I hope that I'm, I'm sure that these, uh, uh, you know, this lecture would be available to you afterwards as well, so feel free to reflect on it. Now, when people outside of PWS, when you go to a medical provider or you go to your own primary care provider, you say, you know, I'm having a lot of anxiety, not able to sleep, the first thing that they're going to reach for is something like Alprazolam, which is also called Xanax, right? Or Ativan, which is called Lorazepam, or Clonazepam, which is Clonopin. Now these medicines are called benzodiazepines and they work on a receptor called uh, GABA receptor and it is a general calmer downer and it's a really powerful, strong medication. However, it's very important to note that our patients, because of the same reason that I've mentioned, the front part of the brain, which is responsible for controlling so much of the rest of the brain, has low volume, like it's already depleted to begin with. Now we're giving them any medication that reduces their reserves, their reserve cognitive capacity. Any medicine that lowers it may give you temporary relief, but it may actually make things worse over the long run. So there's a, an important role for benzodiazepines, and I do prescribe it uh, on occasion, but for most patients, it may not be you know, worthwhile in the long run. So you want to keep the dosages low, minimize them as much as possible. Some of you might have already experienced this, but sometimes the doctor might prescribe it saying that, you know what, this is going to help calm them down. And lo and behold, they get more agitated and aggressive after taking the medicine. And that's 
because of paradox, it's called paradoxical agitation. And the reason that happens is that they're, again, you know, their executive functioning, whatever little bit was left where they were able to control themselves is gone. So yes, if you give them a lot of it, they're going to fall asleep. But if you're just giving them enough to like, you know, make them even more sort of disinhibited, it may lead to more aggression. So just be mindful of those aspects. Now, the other very commonly, um, you know, sort of prescribed group of medications is uh, serotonin receptor uh, inhibitors or, or S SRIs or SSRIs. And these are medicines like Zoloft, which is Sertraline, Selexa, Lexapro. I'm using brand names just because they'll be more familiar to you. Um, citalopram, uh, Prozac, which is fluoxetine. Again, very effective um, medications and they have a strong, like uh, uh, an important role to play. It comes with a big, you know, tablespoon of warning though, because um, they can cause mania in patients who are prone to develop bipolar type symptoms or other mood symptoms. So some of you might be familiar, um, uh, you know, and I can, you know, speak with uh, you separately and it's like it's a separate, like large topic to talk about, but the psychosis is quite common in Prader-Willi syndrome. And in my research and other research that has been done in the past, we've noticed that the kind of psychosis that occurs in Prader-Willi syndrome is actually m more uh, linked to a mood episode, right? It's not like schizophrenia where people get sick and they get, you know, there's a step down. It's not like that. It's episodic. It's usually short-lived. It's intense. It has a lot of mood symptoms, very often manic symptoms, sometimes catatonic features. And that can, because it's so common, especially in patients with UPD, but also in patients with deletion, we've seen it in both, but it is more common in patients with UPD, um, given that that vulnerability is present in our patients, I am extremely cautious when I'm giving uh, SSRIs. I can, you know, I can hardly think of a few patients that I've ever prescribed this to. So just something for you to keep in mind. You know, I'd much rather use some uh, of uh, the other options or even psychotherapy for mild to moderate cases um, rather than reach for an SSRI. So I don't have a separate section on psychotherapies, but um, like a, I, I have to say that the earlier you start psychotherapy, the better it is. And you should consider many different kinds of modalities. If, you, if, the, if your child has features of autism, even if they haven't been diagnosed, you really should consider uh, ABA type therapy, which is applied behavioral analysis. And that is so effective, especially if it started young, uh, at a younger age, right? Remember, because we are not thinking only about anxiety. One can say, okay, why, you know, why do I need to start ABA for anxiety? But now that you understand the background, right, that it's not just simplistically calling an anxiety, you can't, like, it's, it's different in PWS. It is helpful to have an ABA therapist. Uh, CBT has a role. Supportive therapy, just have, I mean, for the, my higher functioning uh, patients with who have anxiety, uh, you know, just having, seeing a therapist on a weekly basis or every two weeks, it's helpful to them. So, and, and then for caregiver burden and caregiver anxiety that many, many of you, you know, may be struggling with, taking care of yourself really truly trickles down and helps the patient. So I always ask, my, not only my patients to get that therapeutic support, but also the parents to get the get similar support. Now, speaking briefly about antipsychotics, again, you know, of course, uh, antipsychotics would be the medication of choice if the anxiety, the underlying, if the anxiety is coming from an underlying, you know, uh, psychotic process where they might be hearing voices or they're feeling paranoid. And, and that is showing as anxiety, right? So as you can imagine, anxiety can present you to many different things. And one, the most severe reason for an underlying anxiety disorder would be, uh, for uh, like the presentation of anxiety could be an underlying psychotic condition. So something to look out for. 
Um, if that happens, of course, one has to reach with uh, reach for antipsychotics. There are many different kinds of antipsychotics, um, many different, uh, and each antipsychotic, I mean, really, you know, antipsychotics have different side effects and you have to weigh the pros and cons and all medicines are different. So when you're really, when you're starting to think about antipsychotic type medications, you really should be in the care of, uh, you know, um, a psychiatrist. Uh, important to note that almost all antipsychotics can cause significant weight gain and metabolic syndrome, um, not just by increasing appetite, but also by slowing metabolism. So, uh, of course, for most of our patients, you got to be very sort of careful with adding them and then increasing the dosages, and you have to monitor the weight uh, very closely. Interesting to see to note, I mean, in my uh, practice, now with growth hormone being sort of commonplace and almost everyone being on it and then strict uh, food security in place, I don't see a lot of patients with morbid obesity, which used to be like the norm, right? So um, so I, I'm, I'm becoming more and more comfortable with using antipsychotics because they're so powerful as a tool. To, to deal with uh, some of the more severe forms of uh, psychiatric issues. Now, the other um, class of medications that are very useful would be mood stabilizers. And mood stabilizers are think medicines like lithium and medicines which can be grouped under the classification of anticonvulsants. Now, lithium, I would suggest as a choice only when there's significant risk of suicidality or homicidality. Now, suicidality. Now, I'm, I'm, you know, again, this is, uh, it's not suicide. Having thoughts about suicide. I mean, although many of my patients with PWS sometimes say it. Okay, if I don't get this, I'm going to hurt myself. Or you know, if you don't do this for me, I'm going to kill myself. Usually, it's said impulsively and it's not really acted out upon. However, there are some patients who are having serious thoughts about suicide, in which case lithium would be a very effective medicine because it's one of the very few medicines which has been shown to reduce suicidality. The anticonvulsant type medications are things like Depakote, Valproate, uh, Lamictal, Lamotrigine, Topiramate, Topamax, uh, carbamazepine and oxcarbazepine, right? And which is Tegretol and Trilepto. Now these medicines, uh, again, each one of them have a dif have different side effects. Most of them do cause weight gain except topiramate. Now many of your loved ones might actually be on topiramate and there could be two reasons for it. One is that it does, they, that it actually causes weight loss by appetite suppression which is a great thing. The other reason it's commonly prescribed by people who know PWS and have treated it is skin picking. It has been shown to reduce uh, skin picking. Um, and I've used it also judicially, like, you know, in, in certain cases. Now, the problem with topiramate is, uh, is that it can cause cognitive blunting. So it, it slows the cognitive process. So if someone is already struggling significantly with, you know, academics or thinking, they're kind of like slow in, you know, response, I would not use topiramate for them. If it is not a concern in the sense that if someone is extremely high functioning or if someone is like nonverbal and they're picking and other needs are more important than uh, cognitive functioning, then topiramate is a good choice. Another thing to look out with topiramate is look out for, is uh, kidney stones. It can cause kidney stones. So, you know, you want to make sure that uh, there's no sort of uh, history of kidney stones when before prescribing it. Now, uh, there are other medicines that one should keep in mind. And uh, I'll first go over like some of the more kind of uncommon ones, Buspar or Buspiron. Um, it's it it is sort of an atypical like a sort of like a weird anti-anxiety medicine. It has been shown to be very effective for generalized anxiety disorder. I 
you know, I don't prescribe it a lot, but there is a role for it. The problem with it is that it, it needs to be taken at least twice a day. Most people will take it three times a day. Mirtazapine, very effective uh, anti-anxiety medicine, antidepressant as well. It's taken at bedtimes, so it helps with sleep as well. But again, it causes a lot of weight gain and it can cause hyperlipidemia. There is a role for it, so if you have one of those uh, kids or uh, you know loved ones with Prader-Willi syndrome who has who's like who actually has had weight loss or has had you know um, uh, or you know other sort of uh, uh, reasons where you, we're not really concerned about weight gain, then mirtazapine can be a very good choice for anxiety. Again, it is still an antidepressant type of medicine, so just like SSRIs. Um, it can lead to sort of bipolar type or manic type presentation in patients who are at high risk. Now, uh, I'm gonna, f uh, so bupropion is Welbutrin. Welbutrin is, a, is one of those antidepressants that does not seem to cause as much um, manic switching. So in my high functioning patients who have, uh, with PWS who have uh, depressive symptoms, um, I do give them um, Welbutrin at low dosages and they seem to do well. Uh, the no-no, the reason not to give Welbutrin, like a contraindication would be if someone has seizure disorder. If someone has a seizure disorder, you should not be um, taking uh, Welbutrin. Um, many of you might be f familiar with NAC um, and you know, it, a brand name which was like which had some, which had the uh, um, early studies done on it on PWS was Pharmanac, the effervescent tablet. I don't really sort of prescribe Pharmanac per se. Any NAC from like a good, you know, good enough company uh, is is fine and it's available in general stores and pharmacies uh, over the counter. But uh, people underdose NAC, so you really need to hit higher dosages to get full effect from NAC. Um, you know, people just stop with the one tablet once a day. It's not, it usually isn't enough. I have patients who are on much higher dosages. Um, again, there are pros and cons to consider, but NAC is really well tolerated, especially in younger patients. When someone is older than 50, then it, in general, it's advisable to minimize use of too many uh, vitamins or other antioxidants. Um, because it can, you know, if you take too many vitamins at an older age, it can precipitate or trigger, um, you know, cancer type presentation. So that's the only reason I have never seen anything like that happen, but there, are, there is reason to be cautious there. Now, there is some early evidence with DCCR, um, as you might have heard in other uh, sort of um, presentations, uh, it, it does reduce obsessive compulsive symptoms in particular, which is a very interesting finding. Pitolescent uh, does tend to, uh, you know, there's some early evidence, again, the studies are not completely done that I'm familiar of, uh, with, that it helps with anxiety. Uh, it may help with the impulsivity and anxiety in addition to the sleepiness. Then there's CBD. People will definitely ask me about CBD, so I'm gonna ask, uh, answer that right away. CBD has very, again, early evidence. Um, we have a panelist tomorrow we'll be talk, which will be talking about the CBD derivative, so that'll be interesting to hear. I'll also, I'm also looking forward to it. CBD is not, uh, has not been shown to be harmful Unlike THC, you know, which is the active like, hallucinogenic sort of euphorogenic sort of component of cannabis. So CBD apparently sort of reduces the effects of THC. But, you know, people, ha it's hard to get pure CBD. And in anecdotally, uh, you know, the, it's hard for me to sort of like, um, based on what I've heard from patients, it's hard for me to sort of suggest that strongly, but I think there's more to come and there's a lot of interesting research happening. And I think we'll have more answers about CBD in the future. Uh, so that brings me to Guanfacine XR. Um, Guanfacine XR is available uh, right now in, uh, in the form of Intuna, which is the brand name. And it's actually generic at this point. So I just serendipitously, you know, six years ago when I was first treating my first patients, I found this to be like a good, uh, 
medication in the sense that it's not as you know it helps with impulse control it's well known to help with impulse control it's been around for adhd for uh, it's been tested in autism has been shown to help with aggression self injury uh, and uh, and it increases the activity of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex the part of the brain that we noted was uh, you know affected in patients with pws so I, I had some really uh, early sort of success with treating patients with uh, Intunev just by exclusion of other medicines which have so many other side effects. And again, the most common side effect is sleepiness, daytime sleepiness. So the patients who have excessive daytime sleepiness, uh, they may, it takes them longer to adjust the medication. So uh, it takes about four days for anybody to kind of like get steady state with, uh, with guanfacine. So when you take it for the first time and you feel sleepy, it shouldn't alarm you because it takes four days for it to kind of normalize. So it really, in my practice, usually I give them a week before I make the dosage adjustments. So I did sort of, uh, you know, we got some, um, just to sort of get a sense of how well people do on this, we did an, uh, a, an open label sort of case series. I just looked at the charts of the patients that I had treated, and then, uh, and this was again uh, uh, quite a few years ago, and then uh, I had treated 27 patients with uh, Intunev, and, and we noted that um, 81% uh, and 82% and 93% of individuals showed an improvement in skin picking, aggression, and ADHD respectively. And ADHD was expected because it, it is an ADHD medicine, that's how it was FDA approved. But it was interesting to see how much it reduces skin picking and aggression, which brought us to uh, the clinical trial that we, I'll be talking a lot more about tomorrow, so I don't want to take too much time, but there is a clinical trial that we are running right now. We are recruiting starting um, end of the year or early January at the latest and I have the phone numbers here. I also have, I don't see, unfortunately, I, I see um, uh, in my private practice, I have limited availability, but I have given that uh, number as well. If you're interested in the Guanfacine XR clinical trial, please uh, feel free to call Dr. Theresa Jacob. She's my partner, uh, co-investigator, and she's, a, uh, she's the director of research at Maimonides Medical Center where I work. And you have my phone number and my email address if, should you have any questions or I won't be able to answer like clinical questions uh, on my email. But if you have like a general inquiry, I'm happy to answer uh, those questions. And uh, Susan, I think um, I'm ready for any questions. I hope this was helpful. It was like I was talking to the camera and it, I was trying to imagine 200 people watching me. It was just hard to do. <laughs> yeah, we got up to 220 at one point, and I encourage you all to just hold on there and stay with us because we've got some really great questions that I think that many of you are going to learn from. Before we go into questions, I did just want to mention to everyone who's joining us today, I personally asked Dr. Singh to review these medications because I feel that as you're on this journey, it's important to have heard some of these um, names before you're having the conversation with your personal psychiatrist. It's nice to be able to walk into the room and have a basic understanding. That said, especially for our youngest families, um, you are not going to experience every um, symptom that Dr. Singh has discussed today. You will not need every medication that has been discussed today you are going to have your own journey. Um, anxiety may or may not be a part of it. Medication may or may not be a part of it. So take all of this with a grain of salt. Um, determine what's best for you and your family. And um, my own personal advice is to simply develop a relationship with a person that you're comfortable with early on. Maybe it's a psychologist, maybe it's a psychiatrist. But before you're, you're struggling and at the end of your rope, you really want to have your support system in place. So that said, Dr. Singh, my first question for you is, in your professional opinion, when is it the right time to bring a psychiatrist on board? So uh, I think, uh, you know, Susan answered that question for me um, beforehand, because she's absolutely right. You need to be proactive 
don't be reactive because guess what our patients are reactive so we need to be proactive so so take that step early on i've had patients as young as two years old with no symptoms at all the parents just coming in talking to me getting a sense of what to expect what not to expect like a more nuanced discussion like something similar to what we spoke about today but then like kind of like uh, talking about it sometimes because there are genetic factors you know if if there is a family history for example already independent of the prader willi syndrome if there's a strong family history of depression anxiety bipolar disorder schizophrenia i would say earlier the better okay um and i would say that the biggest uh, the biggest sort of uh, telltale sort of sign that you need to go see someone proactively is if you start feeling caregiver burden just ask yourself how difficult is it for me to take care of my loved one on a day to day basis that's a difficult question to ask we don't allow ourselves the opportunity to be vulnerable with ourselves it's very important to ask yourself the question and if the answer is that okay this is more than a 5 out of 10 it's reaching like a higher level and i'm stressed out that's the time for you to and it, you may not even need to take your child with you but you know talk to someone about like what's going on what might be affecting my child and how can i sort of uh, deal with uh, his or her issues differently i can't agree with you more i know my own anxiety levels will sometimes mirror my son's and it's usually indicative that it's time to go back in and have that conversation um with our with our uh, team so we have a lot of questions specifically around ssri so i thought we could take a minute and further discuss those a little bit in your presentation uh you mentioned that you don't recommend ssri's Selexa is one that's widely prescribed within the PWS community. Um it sounds like perhaps you tend to go lean towards Wellbutrin as a first choice. What would what would you tell the parents who are currently on Selexa or considering Selexa? Would you steer them in a different direction? Right. So okay, so I think I I should add like a caveat in the sense that you know, uh, you have to imagine you have to remember that psychiatry still has a strong stigma against it so by the time people are coming to see me they've seen the podiatrist they've seen the faith healer they've seen 20 different people and they have no other option and then they're coming to see me things are changing rapidly people are recognizing how important mental health issues are uh but that's not always the case so uh, that's why i think my my sample size i mean the people that i'm treating might have gone through selexan had negative experiences already so that kind of you know you have to kind of keep that in mind for the for most patients who are like preteen or uh, early adolescent uh, selexa will be fine it's during the time of adolescence and young adulthood that that the risk of sort of psychotic uh symptoms kind of go up so uh, similarly wellbutrin as well i kind of reserve for patients who really are pretty high functioning and they you know uh, and they're uh, they you know they've never had seizures so that you know seizures are quite common at higher doses of wellbutrin so uh, and and you really don't see, like any ssris you got to i think you have people all right okay i'm mumbling so i'm going to take a step back All right. SSRIs are very commonly prescribed by non-psychiatrists. Okay? That's always been the case. So you go to a primary if I go to a primary care uh, uh, provider right now, they're going to give and I say I'm feeling stressed out, I haven't slept in 3 days, okay? They'll give me an SSRI and they'll ask me to come back in 6 months. So I think there's a comfort level with non-psychiatrists. Psychiatrists on the other hand, we we've seen like the side effect aspects of it so if if your child is already on an ssri like selexa or zoloft and they're doing fine no need to change it just remember that if you all of a sudden start noticing a change in their behavior which is that they're not sleeping there's a change in their sleep they actually reduce food intake all right and they start uh you know talking excess- excessively or saying things that don't make sense or they're not based in reality the first thing i would do is talk to your doctor and maybe get rid of the ssri 
stop it cold turkey. That's the only caveat I have. The likelihood of you having that reaction is, is lesser than the benefit that you might be getting from the medicine already. So I won't recommend stopping it um, unless there's reason to. So if you're seeing the kind of symptoms that I spoke about and you're nervous about it, talk to your doctor. And uh, one thing to consider would be the risk of switching their mood due to the SSRI. All right. Um, are there certain classes of drugs that are more habit forming than others? And do you take that into consideration as you're prescribing? Would you try to avoid certain drugs because they are more inclined to be, cause a habit? Yes. So uh, the the commonly among the commonly prescribed medications which can become habit forming the there are two. So the benzodiazepines that we spoke about, medicines like Xanax, Alprazolam, and you know, clonopin, they can become habit forming. And the other ones which we did not talk about today because it's not really used for the treatment of anxiety is stimulant medications, which are quite commonly prescribed. Ritalin, Concerta, uh, Vyvanse, medicines like that. Now, both those medicines are actually in, in the PWS community. I do not see that like really, I mean, I can't think of a single patient of mine who has, uh, you know, who I can actually diagnose with an addiction disorder. Because, you know, I think they're very closely monitored and if they're being prescribed medications by, uh, by uh, a trained uh, medical provider, then they will keep the medicines low enough that it's not being overused. Uh, plus, we have the support of you guys, the parents and the family members, and they, they, you guys are really good with making sure that things go, don't go out of hand. The, now, but there's a difference between something becoming a habit versus something, uh, people becoming tolerant to medications. Now, with benzodiazepines in particular, right, the medicines which are, and very often it's prescribed for sleep, uh, these medicine patients tend to get tolerant to the dosages. So you find yourself having to, the patient will need higher and higher dosages to get that same effect on anxiety or sleep. It's, it doesn't mean that they have a habit, it's just that naturally the medicines work in such a way that the body gets used to it over time. That's why it's not really a good idea to be on benzodiazepines in particular for long periods of time. All right. Um, how about risperdone? It can have a fairly bad reputation in the typical population. My own psychiatrist was very reluctant to prescribe it. What's your position on using risperdone for treating anxiety in PWS? All right, so again, it depends on what the anxiety is being caused by. If the underlying, as I think we have all, hopefully the one, one uh, you know, take home message was the anxiety, anxiety looks very different and the underlying cause of anxiety is what we need to treat. If the underlying cause is a mood disorder or psychosis, right? Or if your loved one is engaging in severe aggression, right? Then th there are really very few medicines which work as well as medicines like Risperdal do. Now these are antipsychotic medications, they have side effects. Um, but Risperdal has been around for many, many years. It's very well known. It's we know what to expect, what not to expect. In general, at low dosages, under the right supervision and with monitoring of metabolic symptoms like weight gain and uh, lipid panel and things like that, Risperdal is quite effective. Um, so, like, for example, if someone came in, like, you know, severely aggressive, I wouldn't even waste my time on uh, anything else. I would go to something like Risperdal. That's not the only medication, but it just it has been around for a very long time. It seems to have, you know, lesser side effects. And it's kind of like it does cause weight gain, but not as much as some of the other ones. And, uh, and it's also, you know, uh, it, it's... Uh, it's kind of, it's easily available, it's cheap, most insurances will cover it. And it also comes in melting tablet form, which makes it very easy for, so like, so for example, I mean, I'm going into a lot of detail, so hopefully there are a few providers listening as well, uh, because it'll be more helpful to them. But, you know, you can start at a low dose and you can give rescue pills, which is the melting tablets, 
and then that allows you to kind of find out what the final dosage would be. So for example, if you're having to use the rescue tablets every day, that means that the, the standing dose, the medicine, that, that's not enough. You gotta go up on the dosage. So, you know, it's kind of, it's easier to kind of um, work with. But there are other options which are uh, equally effective, like loracidone works quite, uh, quite well, needs to be taken with food. You know, uh, ziprasidone, which is geodon, works quite well. Uh, there are medicines like, uh, even the older medicines, some patients will respond better to the older medicines, which are medicines like Haldol. But then the, the older medicines have more side effects when it comes to like, if you have to take it long term at higher dosages. I hope that helps. Yeah, it's not, it's not a, it's important not to fall into the trap of like hating a medicine just because it's got bad press because of like every, every patient is unique and they'll respond to different medicines. And anything which has been around for as long as medicines like Prozac has been around uh, and, uh, and uh, Risperdal, these medicines have been around for so long that they obviously they'll have some bad press because over time there'll be some side effects that will show up. Sure, and each individual is unique, correct? They're gonna respond slightly different than everyone else. So sometimes this is gonna be a bit of trial and error. 100%, 100%, there will be, and there'll be some teething issues. So it's, it really has to be a collaborative process. That first slide, you know, you have to develop a timeline with your provider and really, you know, work with them and, you know, don't expect miracles, uh, but know that, you know, as long as you're working in a team, as a team, you have a few target symptoms, like what is the most important thing to address right now and focus on that. I think that will be a better way to, like, rather than, like, trying to fix everything at the same time. Okay. We talked a lot about anxiety. Um, uh, one of our questions coming in is about impulsivity. So if you're experiencing impulsivity, does that require a different treatment course? Right, so uh, I think I was trying to draw, like connect the dots between anxiety and impulsivity through this presentation. And although the outward presentation would be that of someone who's worrying a lot, the underlying cause could be impulse control issues, right? So. Um, the treatment for impulsivity would be different. And that's why, I mean, most of my patients actually respond very well to non-SSRIs, non-anxiety medicines, because you treat their impulsivity, and lo and behold, they don't appear anxious anymore because they have better impulse control. They have better executive functioning. So for that, I do gravitate more towards medicines like guanfacine. If they have a lot of ADHD symptoms, I do use stimulants as well. If someone has pure anxiety to the point that you're seeing panic attacks and you're seeing like overwhelming, incessant anxiety, then SSRIs and benzodiazepines are fine. But otherwise, if it's coming due to an underlying impulse control issue, which was the question, I would stick to medicines like guanfacine um, or, um, you know, depending on how impulsive they are, because impulsivity can extend into aggression. And if they're seen showing a lot of aggression, then in addition to Intuna, we may have to look at things like, um, you know, um, uh, Risperdal and other antipsychotics. Sometimes mood stabilizers, Lamictal uh, in particular is pretty safe and uh, uh, you know, sometimes I've had to use valproic acid, which is Depakote, that tends to help as well. All right. Um, a lot of patients end up um, getting a cocktail, combining multiple medications to address their individual's needs. This, um, this person has submitted a question asking about your experience combining Concerta and guanfacine, do you recommend that they both get com combined and why would you need to do that? So in patients with and without PWS, this is, very, this is a very common combination. Um, in patients with ADHD, in fact, like ADHD without PWS, people usually start Concerta or something like Concerta, which is a stimulant medication. And if that's not enough, they add Intuna or guanfacine, right? In my practice, I do the opposite. I start with Intuner, right? Because the stimulants, I want to keep the dosage of the stimulant low, right? 
and I don't want to something like our patients, especially the younger patients, they get dysphoric, sad and angry with stimulants alone. So I usually start with Intunib and if that's enough, I don't add the stimulant. If that's not enough, then I add the Concerta. Now people underdose the Intunib. Okay, so again, people are not as used to prescribing Intunib or Guantacin as they are to, uh, to um, stimulant medication. So they tend to stop at three, four, two, three, four milligrams of the Intunib and then you know uh, you end up being on higher dosages of the stimulant whereas for most patients especially if they're older than 12 years old you can go up to seven milligrams over time of guanfacine extended release so that's just something to keep in mind yeah but it is safe to take them together uh, it's not uncommonly prescribed together that's really interesting that prescribers are commonly under prescribing guanfacine specifically how do you as a parent address that do you is there um, literature that we bring to our prescriber? or How do we even know that they're underprescribed? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I don't think I, uh, yeah, there are, there is literature out there, but they're gonna have to do some digging, you know? So like, for example, even in my study, I think I, uh, like the study that I published earlier, uh, like most of the patients were only on a max of six milligrams. So it doesn't mention seven. So they'll have to go deeper and look at the non, like uh, look at the uh, the initial pharmaceutical uh, trials and the dosages that they used. So FDA approved it only up to four milligrams, but FDA does not regulate doctors, right? They 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 can only regulate pharmaceutical companies. That's something that the parents don't realize, and doctors who are not familiar with the medicine may not feel comfortable going higher than FDA regulated amounts, but. There are, there are studies to show that you can go up pretty safely. The risk with higher dosages of Intuna is not as much the risk of the medicine itself, but the risk of stopping the medicines suddenly. Because Intuna is a weak blood pressure uh, lowering medicine, but as you can imagine, if you're on higher dosages of a weak medicine, it becomes a strong medicine. So all of a sudden you stop the medicine uh, and the blood pressure might go up. Now, it's rare, but you know, uh, it's like I've had I had a patient who took 12 milligrams of Intuna by accident the other day because the parent kind of uh, you know it happens. You know, you're busy between many things and you accidentally forgot that you already gave it to them, and then ended up with 12. Nothing happened, and the next day they were back on the usual six milligrams. So these are quite well tolerated medicines. You just have to go very slow on the up when you're upping the dose and you have to go slow when you're go, going down the dose, right? So, but for the most part, it's very well tolerated. Uh, so of course, we're gonna get a lot of questions in about guanfacine because you did spend some time talking about it. Um, you'll also be talking specifically about that trial tomorrow during the clinical trials panel. So for all of you who have lots of questions around guanfacine, please join Dr. Singh tomorrow during the clinical trials panel. He will be one of our first um, presenters. So if you don't have all day, you can just come in, sneak in for his um, and hear more. But for the folks that are with us today, Dr. Singh, could you just tell us real quick, what are the ages that are included in that study? And where is the study taking place if people were wanting to participate? Okay, so it's six to 36. So it's a very wide age group, six to 36. And uh, it will be, uh, the, the site is Maimonides Medical Center. Uh, we are, you know, there, because of uh, the advent of, uh, you know, telemedicine, um, we are able to do many of these sessions um, online. And this is actually my, uh, my like, uh, off one of my two offices. So it's a, the, the experience is similar to this, as you can imagine, the um, the initial visit would have to be on site because we're doing a thorough physical exam and blood tests and stuff like that. But then after that, the next visit we can you know if you're because we can give you the medications and uh, you know placebo or you know you won't know the difference but placebo and uh, and uh, the uh, the active medicine and that's for eight weeks is the blinded study and then at the end of eight so we'll be talking on uh, via video for uh, every week or if you're in the region you can come in 
and then at, on the eighth week we'll be doing a physical exam again so you will have to come in and if you were on the placebo we'll convert you to active treatment at the eighth week and we'll have an open label study for uh, eight more weeks so it's a 16 week total um and uh, you know the silver lining to this horrible pandemic was that uh, you know there's a lot more support for telemedicine so we can provide a lot of the treatment without you having to schlep over it's in brooklyn my monitors so if you if you want to see brooklyn in in all, all its glory uh, make the trip and you love it i love it let's all take a trip up to new york uh, i'll drive there social distance <laughs> Um, we've talked a lot about medications, but we do have questions about ABA therapy, a number of them. Um, when do you recommend ABA therapy versus medications? And at what age would ABA therapy be effective? Okay, so ABA therapy, earlier the better. Now people don't, even, like, again, I mean, I, I feel, I hate doing this because I'm having to, like, kind of, like, I feel like I'm bad-mouthing so many other uh, medical providers. But unfortunately, the second uh, a provider sees the diagnosis of prado syndrome, everything else goes out of the window, right? So they're not thinking autism. They're not thinking anything else. They just see PWS. So you're going to have to, again, educate them that, listen, even if my child has PWS, if... The, the symptoms of autism are impairing enough beyond the diagnosis of PWS alone, you've got to give me that diagnosis because without that diagnosis, I can't get ABA paid for by insurance companies or by schools, period. You gotta be very blunt with them because otherwise you won't get, the, and this that can be life-changing. The earlier, the better. Okay, so uh, most studies which suggest, and I'm, again, like, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if anyone knows this better, but it has, like, the, if you could start it before the age of six or even five, the outcomes would be better. So the sooner the better, but on the flip side, there's no upper limit, right? So if you can, uh, usually, if the child is already aged out of the school system, which for most days are like 21 years of age, I mean, usually after after adolescence, they won't even offer ABA. So I think, uh, you know, it becomes more difficult than they, you might. Some of my patients and my adult patients have been able to get behavioral therapists paid for by Medicaid and other sort of uh, insurance companies. So that's an alternative, but ABA is ideal and the sooner the better. Right. Again, I've got so many questions in this queue that it's fantastic to have you here. What about um, biofeedback? There's a question right, about so that for treating anxiety. Do you think that biofeedback can be used successfully as a treatment? Yeah, if they can sit through it. So, uh, you know, biofeedback is basically, I mean, I haven't conducted it myself. I'm so, you know, um, it's, it's, you really need someone to be able to engage in the modality of treatment. So you're basically put in a situation where you are asked to sort of modulate your anxiety and stress levels and be able to see the response on a screen or on a device where you, you're able to see the heart rate go down and you know they use different uh, sort of ways of showing how your body reacts to stress. This needs a level of executive functioning that, that, many, that many people with PWS may not have. They may not have the impulse control to sit still for that long, pay attention to that process that's happening. They may not have the planning and executive functioning required to be able to see that, oh wait, I slowed my breathing down and wait a second, my heart rate is starting to go down. So if they can engage in that process, that's fine. Biofeedback has evidence for anxiety disorders. I'm not familiar with biofeedback being effective, uh, being studied for PWS, but I may be missing that. Um, it makes sense. You know, it's like any mindful meditative activity, it lowers anxiety, right? You bring your attention back to your body and being able to see that if you calm your body down, your brain calms down as well. That's biofeedback. So it does help, but you need that level of engagement from your loved one. If they can engage in it, I think that's it's worth trying. 
I haven't seen studies or done studies on it. But. All right. I just wanted to show a quick visual. We, people are asking about um, somewhat of the natural history of anxiety. So data from the PWS registry, this is patient reported data, shows that anxiety starts to get more prevalent in as, as um, children begin adolescence. So at ages five to nine, we'll start seeing an increase in anxiety. It starts to increase again um, in that 10 to 14 year old range. Dr. Singh, at what age do you tend to start treating patients? For their anxiety right so this is exactly right actually and you know this is actually not very different from patients with uh, without pws uh, either it may it's it's a little different so in uh, patients without pws it peaks around 12 years of age and then starts plateauing and then very often starts going down uh, with pws also it's very similar so you can imagine like yeah 10 to 14 so yeah so 12 years of age so, um, yeah, so 10 to 14 is, yes, yeah, so this data is quite uh, right. And again, we don't know what the underlying cause for the anxiety is though. So uh, very often in my patients, there could, there could be more severe forms of anxiety that are bringing them to me. But uh, this data sounds right, 10 to 14 years. Right. Well, I'm, I'm thrilled to have you be able to confirm that what we're seeing or what's being reported by parents is um, corresponding with what you're seeing in clinic. We're getting really close to that 4.30 time. Um, we're gonna take just a couple more questions, but I know you've got a lot of work to do on your side. Um, let's talk about hearing voices or talking to oneself. When, does, when is this considered problematic and what would you um, perhaps recommend as a course of action? All right, so in, in again, uh, in, in kids younger than 12 years of age, they might, uh, they might engage in symbolic play and they might talk to themselves and make up imaginary stories and that's not in it by itself unhealthy or harmful. Um, it's usually in the, pre uh, in the adolescence and young adulthood phase where I see like that second uptick, you know, so if I was to make like, uh, you know, a, a chart, there would be one sort of cluster of patients in that 10 to 14 age group and then there'll be another cluster more like the uh, 17 to 25 age group. And that's where you might see more severe. So it's not, so they hear voices and they talk to themselves, right? But it, it sort of consumes them. So they're not able to sleep. So they're hearing voices and it's distracting them from conversation. Uh, it, it, they're, the voices very often say distressing things to them about themselves or others. Um, sometimes they may have thoughts which are, uh, you know, uh, paranoid thoughts or delusions of, of being harmed and they become extremely suspicious and they may uh, sort of, and they can't sleep, that's another common symptom, um, and they might pace around and do purposeless movements, you know, movements that they were not doing before, they might get stuck or refuse to move or they might, uh, you know, put themselves in postures or it's like they, it's almost as if there's a disruption or complete change in their usual behavior. That's how it would present. So it's not as much just seeing them occasionally talk to themselves. It's more, it becomes all consuming and they can't, they, it, you will see this drastic change. And that's when I would like not hesitate at all. If you have someone less than 12 talking to themselves occasionally as part of play, that doesn't, that isn't something that I would get nervous about. Great. Um, just a quick plug for the mental health guidebook that um, was just recently published today. There's a lot of great information in there. Um, it, it, it mentions parental antidotes as well as um, when to be concerned and steps that you can take. So if you haven't already downloaded that guidebook, I would go ahead, go to FWR's website. You will find it in the main menu section. Um, if I get a chance, I can try to copy the link here into the chat, but it may take me a few minutes. Um, based on the number of questions that we've had today that we haven't even had to address, Dr. Singh, I know people would love to hear more from you. Um, how do people, how can people um, get in touch with you? How can they be seen by you? Um, are you accepting new patients? Do they need to come in person? I think our audience would really like to hear that from you. Sure, absolutely. So I am uh, seeing uh, new patients. There might be a little bit of a wait, but uh, I am seeing new patients. 
it's usually uh, after hours or on weekends because during the daytime I'm, my job is more uh, research and uh, teaching oriented. I'm not able to accept insurance, which you know I want to be upfront about because that can sometimes be a limiting factor. And there are many reasons for it, but one of it is because it's a solo practice. I don't uh, need to see patients in person right now. In fact, I'm not seeing patients uh, in uh, the office environment. I'm seeing patients only through telepsychiatry. And this is actually my office, so your experience will be like this. Uh, I have a secure telehealth format. My I have a website, it's www.deepansingh.com. Uh, you guys can go check it out. Uh, it has all of my information, www.deepansingh.com. And uh, my phone number was on the slide deck, but I'll share it again. It's 631-450-3939. And, uh, you know, you can leave me a message. I'll get back to you. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I try my best to kind of like uh, help you out. If you're not in New York State, uh, I can look up which state you're in. And based on your state, I might be able to provide you telepsychiatry longer term. Uh, but for many states, once like COVID ends, I may not be able to continue providing the service. So keep that in mind as well, because I'm licensed in New York State. Right now, COVID has caused us to, you know, be able to extend our services beyond uh, state boundaries. And finally, I think it's important to keep in mind that, um, you know, um, if you sometimes, uh, you know, you may have a psychiatrist or a medical, another medical provider already, and if you're just seeing me for an evaluation where I'm not taking on the role of a prescribing physician, then that is that is beyond state boundaries. So I can sort of like consult, uh, you know, serve as a consultant on your treating team, see uh, your child or loved one, and provide my recommendations to the treating team. And that I'm happy to do that as well. Fantastic. Well, I would love to thank Dr. Singh for joining us today. He was caught in traffic, racing to get to us today, just so that he could have a good internet connection. Thank you so much for coming. I did post the link to the mental health guidebook in the chat along with Dr. Singh's website and his phone number. So, so long as this uh, meeting is still open, you can race into the chat, you can copy and paste it, you can have that information for reference. And um, sharing on the screen right now, this is our agenda for the rest of the week. Again, Dr. Singh will be presenting again Tomorrow morning at the clinical trials panel, he's gonna be talking about guanfacine. So if you have questions, you didn't get all of your guanfacine questions answered today, join us again tomorrow because he's gonna be ready to answer those questions for you. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Singh. I hope that we will all connect again next week and this recording will be made available in November. So have a great rest of your day. Don't let the anxiety get you down. We're all in this together and we'll see you soon. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you guys.